What's up, amigos? It's the Prodigy Maker Show, episode 56, broadcasting to you live from Manchester, Vermont. Beautiful Manchester, Vermont, in the middle of fall foliage season. Incredible scenery here in the mountains of Vermont at this time of the year. Today's show is about moon ballers and moon balling. I thought it'd be a funny show and also helpful for some parents and even coaches who are frustrated with moon balling strategies. It's on my mind because I had a lot of players in the Little Mo regionals and I had and the nationals actually I had a uh, one boy go down to nationals in Texas. He did quite well. Congratulations, Henry. Good job, buddy. And also I have I had some players in the regionals and there was some drama about moon balling. Also, I saw some video of some matches from the nationals where there was a lot of moon balling. And I guess there's some drama with some parents. I'm not gonna get into I'm not gonna name names, but there's there's um some conflict. Uh, from uh, between some parents about you know certain players moonballing too much or using moonballing to win matches that they shouldn't win or or um, you know is a player is it is that is that a legit strategy uh, in nine ten you know or under twelves and some parents you know saying it's not and that little Mo should do something about it or, or what are they gonna do I don't know. You know, I think since the beginning of time, you know, hitting a high ball is uh, part of the game of tennis. And, you know, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the moon balling controversy. You know, I don't know. Anyone in the little Mo scene kind of knows what I'm talking about. And like I said, I'm not going to uh, dig direct. I'm not going to name anyone's names or get into, you know, personal uh, attacks or personal discussions about certain players. But... But you know, you know what I'm talking about. There are kids who hit the ball sky high at the younger ages, and you can. It's annoying, and it's effective. And I mean, to me, it, it is a, it's a legitimate strategy to hit the ball high. Some people don't like high balls. Some people don't like low balls. And it's part of the game of tennis. It's part of the chess game of tennis. And so when a young kid figures out that if they hit the ball high, their opponent doesn't like it, should they be penalized for that? I mean, should they be, vil should they be vilified or villainized for that? I don't think so. I think that's crazy. Uh, I think it's a, a strategy that works well in the younger divisions, doesn't work so well with, um, you know, at the pro level, um, can work from time to time, especially in women's tennis. You see sometimes a moon ball here and there in women's tennis. Don't see as much on the ATP tour. Uh, in college tennis, it is something, um, it, it is a strategy that you see more in the younger age divisions. And it works pretty well. I saw a video from the Nationals, the National Little Mo's, which was held in Austin, Texas. It's held every year in Austin, Texas. I believe it was from the Nines division. And one of the boys there was sending that ball up higher than I've ever seen. <laughs> he had a, a very, he had, it was like a rocket ship going up. And normally, in my mind, that's not really what I'm thinking about with a moon ball. Like a moon ball is a little more like a top spin, um, loopy ball. That, that's kind of what I teach to my players. I like, I, you know, if, if I say to my students, if you have an opponent who's undersized, not very tall, diminutive or just they have a one-handed backhand or you, you notice that they don't like whether they have a one hand or a two hand or they don't like balls above their shoulders you know hit a heavy topspin looping ball to kick the ball up on the other side and attack them that way you know it, it really is an attack and we can talk about that too it, it is a legitimate attacking strategy but what I saw uh, from I have a confidential video uh, uh, in my archive, in my vault, is, I mean, a little nine-year-old just sending that ball up to the clouds, smacking it up, 
And then the other boy was trying to like half volley it or something and like making a bunch of mistakes. And I, and I thought to myself, that's not what I teach. I don't teach that to my students, but apparently, um, I mean, that, that is the highest uh, level of moon balling that I've ever seen. And maybe that, that's what was happening at regionals. I'm not sure. But to me, if, my, if I had a student doing that, I would probably discourage it because they're not using the technique that I want. I want them to, you know, I teach uh, elastic technique and I teach the players to accelerate and make top spin, even young players, eight, nine, 10. And so that's the sort of moon ball or high attack that I'm looking for, if you want to call it a moon ball. But this is different. This is like uh, not very good technique, sending the ball up kind of flat and high and just like letting it come down like a like a mortar round on the other side <laughs> and the other kid doesn't know what to do with it like like really really high uh so this is uh this is true moon uh, really moon balling to the highest level level 10. what do you guys think about that what do you think about moon balling at that level with that that excessive height it it is uh disruptive why is it disruptive because it's hard to track the ball as it's coming down. Anyone knows if you try to hit a, like a, a, lo a high lob, basically the kid's hitting a lob. Uh, a, a lob that's coming down from super high is difficult to judge uh, just in terms of hand-eye coordination. And so that's what, the, you know, some little kids figure that out. They're like, if I send this ball up really high and it comes down with, you know, at a, at a high speed and it's hard to judge. And it, it's sort of uh, confusing for the other player. The other player oftentimes doesn't know what to do. Do they take it on the rise? Do they take it out, try to take it out of the air? Do they go back and like moon ball it back? But then it's like moon ball back and forth, which is, um, you know, for some players is, uh, is frustrating or, or uh, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, they, some players don't have the patience to do that. They don't know what to do. They, they panic, they freak out. What do you guys think about? <laughs> I, I think it's funny because that strategy is not going to work. So the player is going to learn that that's not going to work long term. It's not a long term strategy. But you know, if you're playing a national eights or national nines or national tens, and it, it it's annoying the other guy across the net, it, it's legit. It's a legit strategy. <laughs> it's a legit strategy. It's kind of like hitting uh, a drop shot or an underhand underhand serve. You know that you see people complaining about. I think those are legitimate strategies. You're going to complain if I drop shot you every time? No, you have to run for it and you have to suffer. And if I hit a really high moon ball, you have to suffer there too. Uh, it's a great play in jun young junior tents because, number one, kids are small. So, so if, it, if it bounces up high, you know, it's harder for them to handle. Kids are not as strong physically uh, above their shoulder just just uh, physiologically uh, an anatomically kids are not very well developed in the young divisions eight nine ten eleven so they have tr trouble with high balls in general their, their, their upper bodies are not developed uh, and it's it's hard hard to time it's hard to coordinate a high ball coming down uh, and most kids in junior tennis have a very poor overhead so the idea of moving in and hitting a smash uh, uh, against that lob is um, not realistic for I think most juniors most young kids do not have a smash that is reliable which is something that should be worked on by the way because like the great coach Andy Brandy likes to say the overhead is the worst shot in junior tennis and he's he's jokes when he says it but Andy Brandy's great great coach by the way uh, you know he's right little kids do not have good overheads in general so Lobbing is, uh, you know, very good strategy. It's very good strategy if someone comes to net. But apparently, if you're on the ba if both players are on the baseline, it's not a legitimate strategy. Interesting. Uh, or it's somehow devious or underhanded. It's 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 a dirty deed if you do it. If some of the other guys on the baseline. Uh, the real lesson here, if, if we, should we, if we want to end the podcast now, the bottom line is you should teach your young player to hit a swinging volley. And that's what I do with my players is, is 
I say, look, if someone tries to hit high lobs to you or high moon balls, you, at some point, you probably need to take that ball out of the air and hit a swinging topspin volley. And so that's sort of where I've, uh, you know, over the years, I had to figure out, okay, what are we going to do if, if a kid does this to one of my students? And that's sort of where I ended up. And I know some other coaches agree with me. They teach the same strategy. And then you have to practice that. So you have to practice the swinging volley. I think that is the solution uh, in these situations. Uh, I think taking the ball on the rise, like off the short, shorter hop, is really difficult, especially if it's a high moon ball, a very high moon ball, very difficult to do. It's actually better and more reliable to take the ball right out of the air. Uh, better for court position also to take it right out of the air. You have some options after you take it out of the air. You can continue the rally. You can take that swinging volley, the topspin swinging volley, and you can go to net if you have a good net game. Unfortunately, most kids who are young don't have a great net game, so it's probably not the best idea. Probably hitting a, a, top, a good topspin forehand is uh, the best way to go, and then continuing the, uh, the uh, baseline battle from there. But, man, you know, I thought about it. And what if a kid just was so stubborn that every point he just threw up like a high lob? It would be the longest, most boring, most frustrating match ever probably to watch and play in. But I'm sure it's happened in the history of junior tennis. I'm sure some kid gets out there and says, screw it. I'm, I'm lobbing this kid all day long until he cries, and that's what I'm going to do. I don't think there's anything we could do to prevent a kid from doing that, except for parents and coaches to teach their kids a little better habits. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if I would call it honor. I, I mean, in some ways, I respect the kid for figuring out a way to win. You know, I respect the kid for for going, you know, for getting into a chess game or getting to this uh, MMA match, and then finding a solution within the rules, it's legal. You know, it's legal to hit the ball high. So finding a solution within the rules that, um, that gives them the best advantage to win. I mean, you gotta give a kid some tactical credit for that. On the other hand, as coaches and as parents, we know that that's not a good long-term way to build your game. Uh, it, it's not gonna. It's not gonna work. Typically, uh, at least not. Um, it's not gonna work. Re repeated, you know, re repeatedly. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna score you many, many points. As players get older, it might work as an occasion, occasional change-up, which you still sometimes see that at high level uh, on high level college and pros. But it's not gonna be a viable strategy to win many points and to to dominate a match. So. Our job is to sort of try to train kids and say, hey, look, you know, you can play high balls, but uh, remember to do so selectively, to do so at the right moments, to frustrate your opponent or to change the pace of the game, to change the, uh, the rhythm of the point. But I, I, would, I would discourage my athletes from, from going out there and just uh, pushing the ball up high over and over and over again because uh, – they are. They might win, but I don't know how much uh, they're learning in terms of their, their, how much they're developing. You know how much they're learning in terms of, uh, you know. Because I think a better strategy. If I saw a student doing that, I would I would bring them aside and I would say, hey, you know, buddy. I want you to play those high balls. Same instincts, same same uh, strategy, uh, but I want you to do it with racket speed. I want you to accelerate with spin and jump the ball up high that way. So you can. So I'm, I'm building up their technique. It's just the kids that are doing it uh, the other way, they're, they're shooting up a high moon ball with no technique, no form, like a big flat you know, uh, slap up in the air, no footwork. Uh, that's not good habit building. And if you do that over and over again, match after match, I mean, you're going to hurt your progress as a player. So to me, I, I would take that kid aside and say, look, you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly legitimate and viable to, to attack someone up high because in tennis, there, there's no rule that says 
uh, there's a certain minimum height that you have to hit at. That's crazy. And I don't like when parents and coaches get up, uh, get really upset when they see a kid play a ball up above a certain arbitrary height and they say, oh, no, that's, not, that's not real tennis. That's not fair. I mean, it, it's, it's within the rules of the game. There's no height limit on, on, um, on hitting a tennis ball. I don't remember seeing that in the rule book, in the rules of tennis. <sighs> Indoors, there's automatic height limit because of the roof, the ceiling. But outdoors, uh, you know, it's fair game. Uh, if my player did that once in a while on a, on in a critical moment to uh, battle psychologically with the other guy, you know, that's okay. But I'd like to see them doing, I want to see their technique developing. I want to see them using racket speed. I want them moving their feet well, setting up in good position, and using topspin, using ef effect, as they say in Spain, efecto. So for me, I guess that's where it bugs me the most is that there's uh, poor technical development when players are, are doing that shot repeatedly. They're not, they're losing out on a lot of uh, good quality repetitions in terms of their technical development. Uh, but the actual strategy of playing a high ball is, it's part of the game. Low balls are part of the game. Like the underhanded serve. It's part of the game. As, lo as long as it's not, uh, you know, when the other guy's not ready, that, that to me is probably borderline, um, you know, cheating or really dirty tricks. But hitting a serve short or soft is part of the game because you can hit the serve really hard too and deep. Uh, so, so obviously the, the, uh, the other side of the coin is you can hit a serve soft and short. You can hit a tennis ball when you're doing ground strokes. You can hit a tennis ball really high and slow. You can hit a tennis ball high with more pace and top spin that has more rebound. And you can hit a ball really slow with backspin that uh, drops short. You know, you can hit balls deep. You can hit balls short. You can hit balls high. You can hit balls low. And these are all different ways, essentially, to attack your opponent. And it's important that kids understand that these are ways to build points. These are ways to build an attack. Uh, so a slow ball can be an attack. That's an important tactical lesson, strategic lesson that I talk about with my students a lot. A slow ball can be an attack. Fast ball can be an attack. A lot of kids just equate attacking with, uh, with power. And I think many parents and sometimes even coaches make the same um, fallacy of, uh, of of thought, of logic, you know, uh, a slow ball can be an attack. A high loopy ball can be an attack. A short slice or off speed slice can be an attack. So I think it's beneficial overall for young kids to learn how to manipulate the ball, uh, to move, to, to ma manipulate the speed, the spin, the height, uh, the angles of the ball, the geometry, using the full geometry of the court, uh, and and playing, you know, within the the legal rules of the game to learn how to uh, um, disturb their opponent. The great Luis Bruguera from Spain, he talks about playing tennis in a way that you disturb your opponent. How to disrupt your opponent? Luis uses the term disturb, which I like. Uh, not to destroy your opponent. He, he, he would add, you know, not, you're not, you don't have to destroy your opponent always with powers. I talk about this with my students a lot. You don't need to destroy them with massive power all the time. You need to disturb your opponent and manipulate them and move them around the court and disrupt them until you get the ball that you want for a winner, uh, a finishing ball. But that's basically building. That's building a strategic point that is uh, attacking. And uh, there's lots of ways to do that, lots of valid ways to do that. Uh, those are important tactical lessons to teach a kid if you're a parent or a coach. Imp those are important. Uh, the kid, a, player, a young player should understand that, uh, the, the tactical nuances there and the, the tactical paradigm there. And they should also understand that if they do want to play up high, they can do so with better technique, better form that will help them
develop a bigger game in the long run. And I think if you develop a player that way and train a player that way, they probably won't resort to that really high uh, moon ball that just looks, it, it's like bad form and, and kind of looks ugly and then everyone just sort of cries or shudders and everyone watching is like, oh no, here we go. Uh, I think players are less likely to resort to that and you can just you can you know if they, if they know they have an, a, a better more viable way to attack someone up high that's also better for the development in the long run i think they'll probably choose that path they will choose that path uh, because at the end of the day kids kids want to get better they want to win now but also get better so i give them a choice to say look you could win and play uh and build bad habits or you could just use my way, use our method, you know, play, play the Spanish way with, uh, with topspin and racket speed and good footwork. And, and, and you can get the same, um, the same benefit because the player will still struggle with that high ball, but you're, you're not building bad habits. So it's better for you. You win now and also you win later because the kids who are throwing up the really high, ugly stuff now are, are maybe winning now uh, but not winning for the long run. They're losing the war, so to speak. They might win the battle, right? But uh, it was fascinating. I, I, I had a, I, uh, the, some of the video that I saw from Little Mo National, I, it might have been the nines division. Uh, I haven't seen a, a moon ball that high in a long time. And I guess it was working. I think the kid lost. So maybe it, it didn't work in the in the end, but uh, I mean it, it probably was very disruptive and very disturbing. Uh, what do you guys think? You guys have any thoughts on this? Uh, I know we're doing a morning broadcast here, but shoot me an email or uh, a comment uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you are listening to the podcast. You can, you know, I'm always available by email or or. Um, I have parents contact me all the time, you know, my WhatsApp or uh, through, through, through socials. What do you guys think about this? Uh, I know some parents think it's just uh, very dishonorable for a kid to play high balls like that. I think if try to put yourself in a little kid's shoes, you know, you're, you're a little tiger, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. You're not very big. You're not very strong. Your parents stick you out there in this cage match that is tennis, that is junior tennis. And you got this other little baller on the other side, and he's not very big or strong either. And, and uh, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to like hit the ball at a certain height all the time, bam, 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 and that's real tennis? Quote, unquote, real tennis? Come on. Put yourself in that little tiger's shoes. He's thinking. He or she is thinking, I'm little. I'm not that strong. I could hit the ball really high. And the other kid, it seems to, it seems to mess with them. They get disturbed by that. They get they not only uh, frustrated psychologically because a lot of kids like panic and then get and they start freaking out or they're yelling and, oh this kid's a pusher this kid's a moon ball pushing is the same thing i had the same conversation I, I think we did a pot did we do a podcast on pushing we might that should be <laughs> episode 57 uh you know pushing is the same thing pushing is a strategy it works really well it wins a lot it wins on many many levels Pro, not at the pro level so much at the t college level not so much but you know and, and there are pushers that win lots and lots of matches and tournaments at, at, at various levels of the game. Why is that? It's similar to a moon ball. It's a different rhythm. It's like a slow ball. It just kind of sits there. And, and, and uh, it bothers people. You know, it bothers because people want you to play a certain way. And I, I just think that, that ten <laughs> tennis allows... Sammy, quiet. Sammy, the Tennis Academy dog is here. Sammy, quiet. I'm doing a podcast. Quiet. Quiet. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sammy <laughs> says no, no moon balls, no pushing. I got to get Sammy back on the program. We used to have Sammy, the Academy dog, on all the programs. Uh, but he, he hasn't been on this one. Get out of here. Get out of here. No. No. 
Um, so I mean, it, it's it's a legitimate play. If you're little, try to put yourself in the little kid's shoes. It's it's maybe one of the best plays they have is to play a high ball. Uh, the other is the drop shot. Th these are excellent plays, and, and then hit sometimes hitting the ball soft. Like pushing is basically hitting the ball soft, and it it, it, uh, it disrupts the rhythm and the timing of the, of the of the baseline battle. And it and it, at the end of the day, those three shots, those three strategies, I'm call they're legitimate strategies. They they are they disturb your opponent. They could disturb your opponent mentally, uh, and. Uh, and they, they, they obviously dis disturb the rhythm and the timing of, of the baseline point. But mentally, those three shots in particular seem to seem to do the most psychological damage. And they are weapons of psychological warfare. The high one, the pushing shot, like no pace, like, and, uh, and the drop shot. Like those shots, they're not powerful shots. They're not very sexy shots that they, they don't look so hot you know people watching the kind of cringe like oh uh, they're incredibly powerful in the sense that they are damaging to your opponent's uh, psychology and they oftentimes disturb not only your opponent's rhythm and timing but they disturb their mental status so that's the other thing. You got to give a kid some credit. A little, you got to give a little ball or some credit for figuring out a way to get under the opponent's skin. That's part of the game too. Tennis is this brutal mental battle, you know, and um, it's legitimate to try to do things within the rules that that make your opponent uncomfortable, that get your opponent to lose focus, that get under your opponent's skin. So when you have a little little guy kid, little guy or girl, uh, shoots up a moon ball, hits a soft uh, pushing shot from time to time, uses the drop shot effectively. Like those shots are, are not only tactically smart, but they're psychologically very, very savvy and mature shots. And I just think that most, many commentators, observers, parents and coaches don't value that at all they they don't see the the value in that and some some parents do and some coaches do but by and large especially parents who complain you know coaches who complain about that th those sort of shots in a match or in a tournament they don't recognize the value uh, of the tactical maturity what you know what what's really what's really happening there that player is exploring all of his chest his or her chess moves and there's there, there's a calculation going on there, and there's a savvy, there's a there's a there's an intelligent mind at work there that I think you have to respect and give a lot of uh, kudos to give give credit to that child for trying for figuring something out, something that works tactically and something that also works psychologically to his advantage. So that's that's the way I see it, and. And, and that all that being said, you, you still want to work with a young kid for the, for the sake of their long-term development. You want to work with a young kid on building racket speed, on, on using those tools selectively at the right moments, maybe, but not as a um, general strategy that you would use for an entire match. And there's a big difference between putting up a moonshot or a high topspin ball or a drop shot on a big point or a at a critical moment or critical juncture in a match than doing it every single point as, as your only strategy. Because that's also a big difference too. So it's, it's also the amount of those shots that you hit, the timing of those shots, when in the match do you hit those shots. Those things matter too. And um, for me, uh, just as a technical coach, as a technical developer, you know, I love building world-class technique. I do not want to see my players hitting thousands of balls without racket speed or thousands of balls kind of with poor footwork or poor body positioning in the relationship to the ball. Uh, and that's oftentimes what happens uh, when kids start to play those types of shots. They get a little sloppy with their form. So for me, it uh, has to be done well technically, the drop shot, the slower hit ball, the high, um, the high moon ball or topspin ball. I prefer it's with topspin. You know, 
Uh, I'd like to see those shots uh, hit in that, in that technical context, uh, in that framework, and then I'm okay with it. Uh, but I, I think what, what most observers are, are complaining about and worrying about and cringing over is when players are not doing any of that. They're, they're making a moon ball their entire strategy. So every point just going up in the air, you know, up into the clouds, cloud, cloud balls, cloud touches. And um, they're not moving their feet. They're not structuring points any other way. So they're not getting a great tact. They're, they're not getting great tactical development in terms of like learning new patterns. They're not getting good technical development. Uh, long, all this, you know, for the long term because they're not accelerating and they're not, they're not uh, moving their feet well or adjusting well. So you see all of these like bad habits that develop with players who are doing this in a sloppy way, or, or when you know revealing that there may be a, a lack of coaching direction or oversight either from the parent or from the whoever's working with them, the coach. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's concerning, uh, but I see both sides of it. You know, I see, uh, I see a, a, an intelligent little kid trying to figure things out, and I love that. I love that. And, and that's what I tell students who do that. If, if I see students doing that, I say, look, I love, I, love, I, I love this. I don't come down too hard on them. I'm like, dude, I'm like, this is really good. You're trying to figure things out because the worst thing is you get a – little tiger in there who doesn't think. They just hit the ball the same way every time, and uh, they give their opponent what they want. You know, that's the opposite. And there are students, there are many kids who do that. They, there are little kids who have great technique, but they never manipulate the ball around the court. They never try to disturb their opponent, and they never learn, they never win. They don't win. They have, like, beautiful games, and they can't win. So learning how to win with like different strategies is is uh, a real it's something that should be lauded and and applauded and and supported but at the same time what i'm saying is you can take you you if you approach it a certain way with a kid you, you tell them look this is really good what you're doing here and then you but you kind of steer them into the other stuff that i'm saying that's that's more beneficial for them long term i think it's a win-win i think you get you get the the, the best possible outcome because the kid's going to uh, continue to explore the chess game of tennis, uh, attack, you know, there's different strategies that, that work and, and ways to d disturb his opponent. But at the same time, he's going to build better habits for the long term. I mean, for me, that's, that's the win-win. And that's what parents and coaches should try to stress. Uh, but I understand. I understand it's a crazy game out there. Sometimes in the under 10s and under 12s, and certain kids are determined pushers, determined moon ballers, or determined drop shotters, those kids are going to be tough to play against. Uh, they have um, try to see both sides of the issue the way I am, and I think you'll get less, a little less frustrated, a little less concerned, because there are some good parts to this, just uh, also some bad parts. Also, it's who's, who wants to watch a match like that? Like, who wants to watch a kid just sending the ball into the clouds over and over? It's like the most boring match ever. It's within the rules, though. Uh, I love to see a good drop shot, but I think if I was watching a match and the kid drop shot it every time, uh, you know, who wants to watch that? It would be interesting. Might be entertaining, maybe. Uh, the bottom line is you, you want your kids to win. So you, I, I wouldn't penalize them for exploring different strategies uh, at their level that work. I would applaud them for that. But at the same time, we want kids to develop for the long term, technically and tactically. So uh, we have to give them some parameters and some guidance on, on how to play the game better uh, without, without uh, villainizing them or penalizing them for for doing everything in their power and and, uh, and in their and using their creative mind to find ways to win within the rules so that's my take on it what do you guys think you know send me a post a comment or send me an email let me know i know it's a it's a big issue in in the special little mo right now it's kind of a, a hot topic in little mo in little mo circles if you're in the little mo world i've got a bunch of really good boys and girls uh, who play Little Mo, had a Little Mo champ 
in 2019. Elana uh, Zaretsky is a girl I worked with for uh, many years. She won the National Nines, I think it was 2019, might be 2018 now. Uh, and I'm working with her little brother, David. Great, great little uh, talented player. I've got uh, another uh, uh, very strong kid, Henry, who's in the Little Mo right now, great player, coming up. And I've got some new boys and girls who are all playing Little Mo. So Little Mo is like really popular for, for young, talented kids. And uh, it's, I think it's a great, uh, overall, great, great uh, tournament circuit. I always recommend my players play Little Mo. If you're not familiar with Little Mo, check it out. What's the website for Little Mo? Uh, you could just search Little Mo on, um, on, I think it's MCB Tennis, but you could just search Little Mo and you'll, they have a, a great national circuit, uh, sectionals and regionals. We host the Little Mo sectionals at my club in Vermont, and I, I always recommend the, the circuit for young kids, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, they, they go up to 12, but uh, by the way, very good uh, tournament circuit. Uh, for young kids, and they have a national championships for um, different age divisions, which is wonderful. So I think overall it's a great experience. Kids, kids usually have a lot of fun in Little Mo, and um, it's some of the great talents of our country uh, are usually found there. You know, you look in the young divisions and you see players who grow up eventually later on and they, they end up on the pro tour. So it is one of the, it's kind of the proving ground. If you have a prodigy, it's a prodigy proving ground uh, and, you know, I coach a lot of prodigies. I love the prodigies. So, um, guys, uh, I loved, uh, I enjoyed talking about uh, moon balling. And uh, we even got a little drop shot and pushing discussion in there. I, I think we did a podcast on pushing before. Uh, anyway, I have a saying, I have a saying, uh, whooshing, not pushing. Don't push, whoosh. Whoosh means racket speed. I prefer my players swing with racket speed. So you got to whoosh, don't push. <laughs> my, students, my students love when I say that. Whoosh it, don't push it. Uh, you know, these are, this is part of the game. And, and uh, it's our job to try to guide our players to, to do a little better, but also to uh, recognize that they're using their brains, which is what we want, people. We want these little kids to use their creative minds to find ways to win because when they get older, that's going to take them very far. They're going to learn to, they're going to become champions if they have a good mind like that. We don't want little automatons. We don't want little kids with perfect technique just hitting the ball the same way every time. That is not how you build a champion. Little kids have to have a good tactical mind and they have to develop that at a young age. So. That's my final parting words for you guys. It was fun. Episode 56 in the books. We'll get this out on the podcast and on the YouTube channel soon. Uh, did you guys know I will be in Florida training the twins, uh, the Sama Bali twins, October 12th week? So starting October 12th, if you happen to be in Florida and you want to come train with me uh, that week, October 12th, coming up soon. Let me know. I will be teaching privately at the SMATS Academy, which is in Hollywood and Hollandale Beach. And I'll be working with the twins, who are another uh, example of super talented uh, prodigy kids. They are 11, and they uh, have big, big uh, expectations for them. They're, they want to be you know, Grand Slam champions someday. So I'll be down there working with the, the superstar twins, Adriel and Safina. And also coaching some other kids who are happen to be in the area. Hey, maybe we go hit the beach or something. So if you're in Florida, uh, October 12th week, let me know. If you uh, October 11th, we're doing a training day at the club in Vermont, uh, which is Columbus Day. If you want to come up for Columbus Day, let me know. Be a lot of fun. We have some players coming up there, so some ex some fun things coming up, exciting things. Uh, what else is going on? You know, I'm here at the academy pretty much every week. Uh, players are visiting Monday through Friday. So if you can't get to Florida and you are in the Northeast or you want to fly in to, um, uh, to come to see me in Vermont, you are always welcome. That is private and semi-private training. It is very personal attention. It's not like a big academy with, you know, dozens of players. We usually have a, a handful of players here at most each week. So it's, it's almost... It's basically like a private all day long with me 
or semi-private, very, very high quality, and I think the players who come here and, and stay for a few days or a week, uh, they really grow and develop as players because after all, they're spending four or five hours a day with me on the court, which is very valuable. So I would uh, definitely recommend that if you have, uh, if you're able to get uh, away from school or have a break, uh, come to train with me in Manchester, Vermont at, at my club and we can do intensive training one-on-one -on -one or, or uh, in a si semi-private way. It's really, uh, the players who are coming in and doing that, they, they love it. They love, I mean, sometimes I'm hitting in, like I'm playing with the kids all day or, or if we need to work on specific technical things, we can do that. It's just, uh, it's amazing, uh, amazing intensive training. So let me know if you wanna come out there. If you're in Florida, hit me up down there and I'll see you guys on the next program. Adios, amigos.